get rid of. About 20 years ago, I was a co-manager. I, uh, I was bivocational, so uh, somebody had um, given me the privilege of being the manager of one of his rental properties. Yeah, that was great. But um, I remember he had calls at 3 in the morning. I got a call from one particular tenant in Price Hill, and she said, Mr. Greg, there is a mouse in my house. And I said, there's a mouse in my house too. Go to bed. <laughs> I was not a good landlord. But, <laughs> but um, it's rough, right? But this is obviously not about that. It's about, uh, in a very real sense, this message is about all of us. Um, we are evil tenants. When you think about it, we've been given the privilege to live in this world that God made. And we have been given the gift day after day to breathe his air to drink his water, to eat his food. I mean, everything here is his, and we have been given this privilege to live here. We're tenants here, and, and yet we selfishly, constantly try to remove God as owner and put ourselves in that place. We want ownership. We don't want to be under his authority. We want to be the owner. We want to be the one in charge of our life and pretty much this world and, and, and do with it what we want and gain things for ourselves. Now, again, um, last week we saw Jesus was questioned uh, by the Pharisees. He was, his authority was, was, was so powerful. I mean, there was no question that when Christ taught or when he did something, it was authoritative. And so they questioned that authority. Now, Jesus answered their question with a question that answered their question. Okay, remember that. Uh, that's exactly what he did. He, he asked them a question and that answered the question they asked him. And in a very real sense, what that answer was, 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 was telling us that he has ultimate authority. Remember the question was, what was the baptism of John? What, what was it? Uh, was it from God or was it from man? And of course, if they said from man, people would revolt because they thought John was a prophet. And if they said from God, they admitted that Jesus is from God. But in the sense, we remember that baptism, right? Especially when John baptized Jesus and, and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the spirit descended on him like a dove and the heavens opened. And so therefore God gave his uh, approval of Christ. So obviously Jesus is saying that I operate with the same authority that John the Baptist operated with, which is the authority of God. Okay. So the parable of the evil, evil tenants then that we're going to see today reinforces that truth. Jesus is still talking. And he's still on that idea of, I am the ultimate authority. All authority is mine and my father's. And the, his plan is being worked out in this world, no matter what it looks like. And that's important to understand. No matter what it looks like in this world, God's providence is prevailing. We've got to remember that. And so let's notice this, that Christ, who now says to everybody, I am the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. I am better than the temple. That's what they were upset about. Remember, that was the, the authoritative question they had. What gives you the authority to walk into that temple and to stir it up and to change things? Who do you think you are? And of course, his answer is, I am the owner of the temple and I am better than the temple and I have come to fulfill everything the temple stood for. I am now the object of your faith. I am the only mediator between God and man. Now let's look at verse one. Before we do, let's pray and ask God's blessing on his word and to give us eyes to see and ears to hear his truth. Let's pray. Our Father, we are grateful to be in this place today. We, we, we take it for granted. We actually are here gathered together hearing from you. So Father, we pray that your spirit will give us ears to hear. Give us hearts that are humble before you. Give us hearts that tremble in, in, at the fact that we are hearing from you. And yet, Father, let us rejoice in your presence. Let us, let us bask in your grace. Uh, let us wonder at your glory and your greatness. That you may be glorified in that. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So verse 1 says this, And he began to speak to them in parables. Now, we see that quite often. Sometimes parables were used to conceal truth. Most often, especially through the early ministry there in Matthew, as Jesus would use parables, he was literally concealing the truth in those parables. Remember, his apostles would have to come to him later and say, what did that mean? And he would give them a more spiritual answer, the spiritual heavenly answer to that parable. 
But sometimes parables were used to reveal. So they can conceal truth or they can reveal truth. This one is definitely to reveal. Everybody got the message here. The Pharisees, by the time Jesus is done with his parable, know exactly who he's talking to and what he's talking about. So he began to speak to them in parables. And here's what he said. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower. Now, everyone who heard those words, most of these folks are Jewish people who understand exactly what he's referring to. This is a, almost a verbatim uh, a quote, a direct quote from Isaiah 5, 1 through 7, and many other places in the Old Testament, which refer to Israel as God's vineyard. That was a common uh, phrase or a sy sy symbolical reference to Israel, the vineyard of God, God's vineyard. And, and so Isaiah 5, 1 and 2 says this. We'll just look at it. He says, the prophet says, let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and he planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And again, that's Israel's story. Of course, God blessed them. He gave them his oracles, his truth. And from that vineyard was to come great fruit and, and, and truth for all nations. And yet they rebelled continually against him and basically gave bad fruit, not good fruit. But nonetheless, that history is there. And so when Jesus now uses this parable, people begin to realize what he's actually talking about. Now let's continue. Verse one goes on. It says again, and he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. Okay, and this is, again, a normal practice. Now let's look at the owner, okay? What did he do? I think it's important to understand this concept of the investment. This owner did all the work, right? The owner of the vineyard put in the time. He invested. He planted the vineyard. He put the fence around those acres. We don't even know how many acres it was, but a lot of work is going into this. He puts a fence around it. He digs a wine vat and a, a, or a pit, for the, for the juice to flow from the, the press of the wines. He built a wine press. He built a watchtower. Why? The, the watchtower gives protection against animals and other people coming in to steal. It also gives protection from the elements to those servants who can live inside. It also provides storage. So again, he put a lot of work into this vineyard. So I think we, I, I'm bringing a point here that the owner invested all of his time and his resources to make this beautiful vineyard and to make it productive. And his goal is that he will receive fruit from it. And then, obviously, he leases it to tenant farmers. We all have heard of tenant farmers, right? The farmer who lives on somebody else's land, farms that land, and he either gets some of the crops or he gets a small portion or he gets a place to live for free. And that's what was going on here. And then, of course, that farmer, that owner, rather, will come back to those tenant farmers and harvest time and ask for some of the harvest. Now, again, from an earthly perspective or a human perspective, this is quite common. This was a common practice. Uh, it was usually unjust. I'll be honest. They would ask for maybe up to a, th uh, th uh, a third, uh, uh, half to a third of all the crops that people could already live. But yet, but yet it was a common thing. And the people would understand, humanly speaking, what this is all about. But from a heavenly perspective, that's what we want to talk about. From a heavenly perspective, God has taken great care to create this vineyard, his chosen people. And then he placed tenants to care for it. Those were the priests, right? And the religious teachers. Their job was to care for God's people, to instruct them in ways of righteousness, to teach them holiness, that they would be an example and bear fruit for God's glory among the world. So there's kind of the symbolic nature in, in this message. However, of course, we know the history, right? Throughout Israel's history, the priests became very selfish, very greedy, and they wanted to take things for themselves, not care for the people of God, not invest in them, but to take everything for themselves. And what Jesus is now basically saying, these religious Pharisees who are questioning him, these religious 
leaders who have now been so selfish through the years and have built a whole system for themselves, not for the glory of God, (laughs) Jesus is saying, your time has come. Your time is up. The reckoning is here. I am the fulfillment of all righteousness. So now look at verses two through five. Let's notice how this plays out. When the season came, that's harvest time, okay? Now now all of the grapes have given their fruit and, and now it's harvest time. The owner sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. Reasonable, right? I mean, after all, they're living in his house. They're living on his land. They're eating his food. They're drinking his water. And he's asking for now a portion back that is rightfully his. What's their response? They took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Here's where the story gets bizarre. Again, he sent to them another servant. (laughs) And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. So that guy goes back with a big throbbing crushed skull. And you know what the owner does? He sends another And him they kill. And look at this. And so with many others, some they beat and some they kill. I mean, at first glance, it appears that Jesus is using hyperbole to make a point. Extreme exaggeration here. The whole account just seems bizarre, right? When you, when you look at it. I mean, a couple things that are really bizarre. The, the, the two things, right? The two bizarre things. Number one... The violent reaction of the tenants. That's bizarre. I mean, the the owner of your your farm sends his rightful servants to rightfully collect a little portion, which is rightfully the owner's, and you beat them up! And you you, you, you kill them! And and you do this for multiple. I mean, we don't know how many. Could be 10, 15. Who knows how many servants came in, in, you know, representation of the owner, and they were just treated awfully. That's bizarre that's a bizarre reaction. I hope you agree. Because I don't want to visit your house if it's not. If you're, not, if you're thinking that's a normal <laughs> bit of hospitality there, I don't like that. But this is not normal hospitality. This is weird. This is crazy. But the other and probably more bizarre thing that we've got to see in this text is the owner. To me, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it would be pretty obvious. The owner sends a servant to collect from his his farm, and the people beat up the guy and send him back with nothing, I think that's it. That owner lawyers up, he gets to the officials, he comes and he takes care of business. But this reaction is inhuman. It's supernatural, right? I mean, it's just, it's bizarre because he continues to show mercy. And he keeps sending one servant after another after another, after another. That's amazing grace. It's bizarre, right? I mean, but what a truth it's representing to us. So again, as we look at this, we think, wow, how bizarre. However, it's not exaggerated when you put it in historical context of of Israel, with Israel and the prophets that God sent over and over throughout the centuries to warn the people, to talk of his love and his mercy and his provision of a Messiah. And what did they do? They killed the prophets. I mean, if you look at Matthew 23, verse 37, that's what Jesus says when he enters the city, right? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. So again, there's no question what this parable is representing to those standing around. And, of course, the early church that read this book, which was written much after, of course, they received this gospel, much after even the resurrection of Christ, they would realize right away what we're seeing prophesied here, in a sense, by Christ. But the idea is how often, he says, I would have gathered you, uh, your children, together as as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. And so that's the history of Israel. God continually sends prophets to plead with them, to give them the truth of God's grace and mercy and provision, and they are unwilling to submit. They're unwilling to listen. And they kill the prophets and beat the prophets and stone the prophets. So he sends one last representative. And again, as we look at those rep 
representatives of heaven. The most striking example of those prophets is John the Baptist, who many of these people would realize possibly Jesus was talking about. He was sent as a forerunner, as a representative of God's kingdom. And how was he treated? Well, he was ultimately killed. So there's one more representative in Mark 12, beginning of verse 6. It says this, He had still one other, a beloved son. Literally, he had still a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Again, exactly what happened to Christ. Even to the point of being taken outside of the city. So there's a lot of figurative things here that we could get into. But the, the, the parable is so plain as, as we see here. I mean, warning after warning after warning by messenger after messenger. And then finally his own son and his own son is killed. Rejected. Now, this idea that they had, by the way, and you see it right there. There it is. I mean, this is part of the, the parable, the idea of taking that property. It's a, it's a concept known as use of caption. There you go. We don't use that word much. Use of caption. Use of caption, also known as acquisitive prescription. That didn't help either. This is, this is a legal concept based on the Roman law of land or property. That's the idea. So, so what does use of caption say? Use of caption says basically that if an owner of a property dies, the occupant of that property will acquire the deed after a certain amount of time passes as long as no living heir shows up. Well, to them, they're saying, hey, the owner must be dead. He's sitting his son. And if we kill this son, who's the only heir, it's ours. That's kind of the idea in a human standpoint of what that verse is saying and what Jesus is saying in that parable. But on a spiritual level, there is a much more ominous interpretation and truth of what's going on here. This is what we need to look at for ourselves. I mean, this is big. Dr. James Edwards, who edited the Gospel according to Mark in the 2002 Pillar Commentary, says it like this. I like this. Look at this. The son goes as the father's representative with the father's authority to the father's property to claim the father's due. If the farmers kill the heir, they reason then they will become the heirs. Now look at this. If humanity can dispense with God or even kill God, then humanity can become God and the heirs to all he made. Now whether that shocks you or not, that is the human heart. That is a picture of the depravity of human nature. I mean, this is really the battle. Man's depraved heart has one goal, folks, and that is to get out from under the authority of God. That's what a rebel heart is. That's why all the old hymns talk about that rebel heart of ours, that wretchedness, that that arrogance, that pride that says, I can do everything that I want to do, that arrogance that says, I will not submit to another ruler over me. There are no absolute rules outside of my desire. Whatever I want to be right is right. Nobody can tell me there's a right outside of me. There are no standards that cause me to be uncomfortable. And therefore, if I can just get rid of those things, if I can do away with those outdated morals, and standards that seem to suppress my ability to enjoy myself, then I will be in charge. Folks, that is the underlying issue with all of us. Pride, arrogance, rebelliousness, that's what sin is. If we can do away with God, we are God. Now, it's not that blatant, and we don't come right out and say that, but that's exactly what sin is. I mean, folks, in our sinful, selfish hearts, we have never been able to shake that question asked by Satan in the garden. Hath God said, hath God said that you can't eat of every tree in this garden? What an arbitrary rule. What a silly, unnecessary rule that is. Just rebel against that. Go against that authority. Eat 
eat what you want, and you become gods. It's the same thing, folks. That's exactly what sin is. This is what we must repent of in order to be saved. We've got to repent of our rebelliousness toward God, our, 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 our thought that, hey, I somehow can make it on my own. Even this is why, folks, the most moral person you've ever known must repent and trust the gospel. Because as we grow up in our church or our religion, and we're, if, we're relying on all of the protocol and, and the formulas and the ceremonies, that is our flesh, folks. And in a sense, even by doing that, we are under, just under the surface, we are rebelling against God by saying, we'll offer our own sacrifices. We will make it to you somehow ourselves. We'll make ourselves righteous. So even the best person must repent of their own good deeds in order to truly be saved. Much less our sin. That's first and foremost. We are, we are, we're all sinners, but man, even our righteous deeds are filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. Why? Because our hearts are tainted with rebellion. Look at verse 9 now, verse 12 of, uh, chapter 12, verse 9 of Mark. Because now we move on and see the outcome of such action of rebellion toward the master. Again, on the human standard, on the human side, what's going to happen to these human tenants who rebel against the human owner or lord of that property? And of course, we'll tie that into what's going to happen to humans who rebel against the holy God of the universe, the owner of all of this world. Again, folks, we can't deny this is God's world operated under his standards for his glory. And anything we do outside of that is blatant rebellion to him. But look at Mark 12, 9. Jesus asked the question, what will the owner of the vineyard do? Will he, he, or he goes, the, the answer is given. He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Again, that's the natural human response, but Matthew 21, uh, on the, the, you know, the, the, the other account that Matthew gives of this same situation, is a little more harsh. Verse 40, he says, when therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, and again, this is Jesus being very wise. He asks the crowd, he puts it back in their lap. What should be done to such rebels? What should be the price, the penalty? And they said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and, and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruit in their seasons, who will bear the fruit that God not only requires, but deserves. Why? Because it's all his. <laughs> and everything in this world should be done for his glory. That's the reason we were made. The whole purpose of man is to do what? To, to obey God and enjoy him forever to obey him, to bring him glory, to glorify God. The word wretches there is something, isn't it? Boy, that's offensive. Wretches, boy, how harsh, calling us wretches. You know the old song, right? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You know, there's been many petitions to change that word because it's too offensive. I mean, what? It offends our sensibilities. I like Tim McCabe. He's got a shirt that says, I'm the wretch that song's about. I like that <laughs> because that's true. To, to save a worm is I. That's another uh, old hymn. They use the word worm to describe us. And again, that's been uh, brought up in outcry. Oh, we can't say worm. But that's what we are, folks. We are rebellious in the sight of a holy God. And again, our problem with humans is we have such a high view of ourselves. But that high view of ourselves and that pride, that arrogance is what ultimately will condemn us to eternity in hell. That's what the Bible says. That's why Christ warns us over and over to repent and rest in his free gift and have abundant life, real life, genuine life, which culminates in bringing God glory for eternity. But look, the other wonderful thing that Jesus is about to do in this parable is to show us that every bit of this is according to God's plan. Every bit of it. That parable that happened, it was, it was part of the, owner, the owner's plan, obviously. Yeah, he sent his son willingly. Part of a plan. Because 
on the spiritual side, there is no getting around that. And as we now look back at the cross and we understand the fulfillment of God's perfect redemptive plan, we see it was always planned like, like that. Had to be just like that. Look at this. Mark 12, 10 through 11, Jesus goes on to say this. Have you not read the scripture? Wow, what an answer. And really, this is, this is the question for Christendom today that I have. When I hear people sometimes talking about things or they've got some, some hodgepodge idea of, quote, Christianity, just this potpourri of theological ideas that don't even make sense, that don't even bring God glory. And my, my, my response is, have you not read the scriptures? Because that, and again, folks, that's why we preach the scriptures. That's why we uh, encourage you to read the scriptures. Every believer must be in the scriptures. Why? Because that's how we hear from God. That's how God reveals himself. His attributes, all of them are revealed. What does nature do? Why can't I go to the woods and see God and feel him? You, you, that's about it. You can go out in nature and you can see that there's a God, but that's all you can do. You don't know anything about that God by nature. Nature just de declares that he is. But his word that he has chosen to give us and preserve for all time declares how he is and what he is and all of his attributes and what he demands from us to bring him glory. That's why we've got to be in the word. So Jesus brings it up here as he does multiple times. Have you not read the scripture? Here he's talking about the entire Old Testament. And here it is, he, he quotes from Psalm 118 verbatim. This is, a, this is verbatim, Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, what is that saying? Well, obviously, if you're at a building site as the temple, which they would have thought about, the first temple, Solomon's temple, grand building, right? All the stones had to be delivered and then cut and chiseled and, and made to fit in place. And, 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 and the best stone is called the cornerstone, that main stone that keeps everything together, perfectly cut. And yet, that old prophecy says that the stone that was rejected is outcast. It wasn't accepted by the people. That stone becomes the cornerstone, the chief stone. It's amazing. And it's unheard of to think, wow, one that was rejected, you don't use a rejected stone to be the cornerstone. No, but God has a plan that goes beyond human comprehension. And here it is revealed, even in the Old Testament, that the stone that the builders rejected would become the cornerstone. This was God's doing. It was the Lord's doing. It was the Lord's doing that Christ would be crushed on the cross. I mean, the statement is puzzling when you first see it. This is God's doing, and we marvel. It's marvelous in our sight. It's marvelous. Even with this parable that Jesus links this to, what is he linking it to? He's linking those words to multiple servants being killed and beaten, and finally a man's only son being killed. And then he goes and says, this was God's plan and it's marvelous in our sight. It's puzzling. Now, it's true that we sorrow over our sin. It's true that we're broken about our sin. It's true that we hate the fact that our sin is why Christ died. But for those who know Christ, we marvel at his grace and we are joyous in the fact that he has taken our sins away. And the only way he could do that is in the cross. That's why we call it Good Friday. A lot of people get really bent out of shape uh, who aren't Christians about why Christians would call the crucifixion of Christ Good Friday. Now, I'm not going to argue with you what day was crucified on. I'm just saying traditionally, we know that when we say Good Friday, we're kind of talking about the cross. I was watching, I was looking at something on, on Facebook and, and this, this girl, atheist girl, had put a, a, a little bit of a, a video on and she was playing like she was Jesus because her filter made her look like Jesus, put a beard on her, you know, she had long hair anyway. But anyway, she was just saying, you know, Good Friday, come on, man, are you kidding me? Good Friday, could you call it something else, guys? I mean, you know, just because my hands were up in the air doesn't mean I was partying and blah, blah, blah. You know, she, just a, hey, why would you guys call it Good Friday? That's, uh, that's, that's sick. And 
And I get that if people don't understand what happened on the cross, they won't understand the joy that comes from the cross. But for those of us who have been redeemed because of that cross, it is joyful and it is a good thing. It was a good thing when Christ took my sin away. And that's what we celebrate. As Isaiah puts it, look, Isaiah 53, uh, uh, verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was laid the chastisement that brought us peace. Peace is a good thing. And with his wounds, we are healed. So there's the joy in that. Yes, it's a horrific thing. And it's a so sobering thing. It shows that our sins were so massive that it took the death of the perfect son of God to redeem us from them. But he did. And he said, it's finished. And we rejoice. And we celebrate as Christians. And we live for him because of his grace bestowed upon us. I mean, even Jesus approached the cross with joy. I mean, we look at Hebrews 12 too. Look at this. Looking to Jesus. That's what we do, folks. That's, that's the command for believers. What's our command? Look to Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. And by the way, how do you look to Jesus? How do you see Jesus? How do you emulate Jesus? You've got to be reading the Bible because that's where you see Jesus. We see him in the word of God. So as we're looking to Jesus, that's what we want. Look unto Jesus. Why? Because he's the founder. He's the author. He's the originator of your faith. And he's the perfecter, the, the finisher, the completer of our faith. Now look what happened. Look at, looking to Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. As he's going to the cross, there's a joy in front of him. Because he knows that this is how I redeem my people. My bride, I love her. I'm laying my life down for her. And it's nothing. When you love somebody with that kind of love, it's nothing to sacrifice yourself for them. That's why we are in marriage, husbands, to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And what did he do? He gave himself up for her, it says. That's how we love our wives. But this is what Christ did. This is why he sees great joy going to the cross because he will redeem his people from their sins. So in conclusion, here it is. Very simple. This is it. This is what, we're, this, is what this parable's about, folks. This world is God's vineyard. The whole world is his. Everything in it is his. He has sent his son as his representative. How will you respond to the son? That's the simple question this morning. The world's gods, including you who are in it, he has sent his son as a mediator to bring you back because of your sin, but bring you back into fellowship with him. How will you receive the representative, Jesus Christ, the only one who can save you. How, what will you do? I beg you to come to him joyfully and receive the mercy and grace that he offers. I mean, that's why we preach weekly the gospel. That's why we continue to go to our loved ones. And that's why we continue to talk to people on the streets. That's why we continue to do what we do. Why? Because we want people to come to know this loving Savior who gave it all to redeem them. First Peter says it like this. We'll close with this. This is, this is, I can't put it any better than Peter. First Peter 2, 4 through 6. Look what he says. And I think it's a wonderful ending to the parable. It's a great tie-in to uh, help interpret it. But verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, and that's Christ, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. So as you come to Christ by faith, you're, you're, you're regenerated, you're changed. And what are you made into? You've come to the living stone himself and now he makes you living stones. And then we're put into this body, right? This is called the church. We come together and, and, and we're being built up as a spiritual house to be holy, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That's the call of the gospel. I wonder if that's the call that most people hear of the gospel. I mean, the idea that this is, this is what it means to trust Jesus. 
I mean, this is a beautiful thing in 1 Peter. It shows us exactly what it means to become a believer in Christ, to be saved by his grace, to be regenerated by his spirit. There's a reason for it, folks. There's a, there's a big reason, an eternal universal reason that God saves people. And it's not just to keep you out of hell. That's a byproduct. That's a nice fringe benefit. Yes. But if we see this context, it's not even mentioned. What is the purpose that God had in saving us and making us his people? That we would be built up a spiritual house for his glory? That we would be a holy priesthood and offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God. So you see, our salvation is about us obeying our Savior and honoring him with our lives and making our lives a living sacrifice. How do we do that? By keeping his commands and bringing him glory as we live in this world. That is a natural desire, by the way, of everybody who has truly been born again by the gospel. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we're grateful once again for your word. We are amazed at your promises because if we put our faith and trust in this gospel that is foolish to everybody around us, and yet if we, by grace, put our faith in the gospel, we will not be ashamed. We will not be made ashamed, but we will be made the children of the God of this universe. Father, we thank you for your grace. Now give us the ability and the desire to continue to serve you with all we have, for it's your vineyard, and all that we have is yours. Let us be faithful stewards and tenants as we live for your glory in this world. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Hebrews 10 reminds us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but rather we're to meet together in order to encourage each other to love and to good works. We're glad to be able to provide these videos as a means of proclaiming the gospel and encouraging Christians in their walk. However, I want to remind you, this is just a supplement to your Christian life and not meant to replace the local church. So I encourage you, find a Christ-centered Bible preaching church and join yourself to it.